Good evening, everyone. Thanks for joining us tonight. We are going to get started with our session this evening. Um, my name is Ben Anderson. I am a regional director with Extension. I work out of Moorhead and Morris, and I'm coming to you from my home and farm in Ottertail County. And so I'm going to introduce Paulo right now. This is a little overview of, of his work and who he, who he, uh, uh, the type of things that he works on. And we're, we're very happy to have him here. Um, in short, he's, he's just one of our soil experts. So we're happy to have him on staff with an extension and the university and we appreciate all his work and we appreciate him joining us tonight. So Paulo, I will stop sharing if you want to get your presentation queued up and I will turn it over to you. All right, thank you, Ben. And thank you, Anna, for the opportunity to present um, to this group today. Um, I have uh, a presentation where I'm gonna be sharing with you a lot of information. And I, I like to think that this presentation is more geared towards those that have just started to farm or have been farming for a little while, but haven't really been in farming for a long time, and maybe started farming out of curiosity, and now are in need of a little bit of more information to make sure that they are doing everything right. Um, and, and like Ben said, if you have questions, please go ahead and ask. Um, I might not be checking on all the questions all the time. Maybe Ben can be on, on checking there, and then he can uh, stop me and ask the questions as we go. Uh, but yep, if, absolutely. Yeah, and then if you see that the question is more general and can wait, then that's fine too. Uh, but if you see questions coming in, then just uh, yes, please go ahead and stop me, and we can we can get to those. Uh, a little bit of a re overview of what we're going to be talking today. Uh, we're going to look at soil sampling. Like I said, this is a 101, so it's very basic soil sampling. Then we will talk about soil testing, what is involved in soil testing, what type of information you, you get, and how to use that information to make decisions on whether or not you need to add fertilizer. And then I will briefly talk about practices that can help maintain and improve soil fertility, especially for those of you that have a small garden uh, or even like a, a small farm, what are the best practices that you can be doing uh, to maintain fertility of your soil and not be limiting productivity because you are limiting certain nutrients. So I have a, a few different examples uh, that I will be using. So I see that some of you have a small garden in your backyard. Some of you have a one or two acre farm. Some of you might have a, a couple thousand feet, square feet garden. There's also people with over 40 acres. Um, so I'll present enough information here that all of you can get some, some idea of what is soil sampling and what's the importance of it. In this example, we have one field here out of the location where I work in Lamberton, Southwest Minnesota. Uh, and we're gonna be looking at how we can do uh, a soil sampling in that area. So this first case is a, a, a farmer owned high intensity management. So this is the land that the farmer has, he's not renting. So he's gonna do a two acre grid. Um, this allows for a close monitoring of hot zones, hot spots, uh, allows for variable application of uh, nutrients, for example, variable phosphorus rates or nitrogen rates or potassium rate or whatever nutrient is being limiting. Uh, and it also has potential for high return on investment because by saving on the fertilizer you're applying, uh, you are making a, an economic savings because you're not putting a lot of fertilizer where you don't need. So in this example, he has determined that he's going to call this field field three, as you can see up here. And then he divided this field into two acre grids. And then each, each grid now gets assigned a name. So this one is field three, grid A, field three, grid B, field three, grid C, and so forth. 
Now, what he does is he will usually hire a company, a co-op, to come and take sort of samples. What they will do is they will drive their ATV up and down this grid. Go back here so I can show you. They will come up here, drive up here, then they go around, come up here, and then drive down the middle. Go over here, drive up this session, and then come back down and drive over this session. And then at each time that they stop, they will take about four cores around that ATV, then they go up again and they take four more cores around the ATV. So take a total of eight cores. They combine those cores into one, uh, into one bag, and then that becomes the, the soil sample for field 3G. Then that's what gets sent out to the lab. Now, another way that he could approach this is by doing uh, what I call a little more detailed analysis. So he's going to drive, instead of drawing straight up the field, he's gonna drive at an angle here and he's gonna make three stops. And here he's gonna take two samples around each stop. So he's only gonna take six cores now compared to before he was taking eight cores. But this will allow for a much more representative sample of that uh, field that he's sampling. In this example for this, um, grid B here, he would have sampled a much broader area and then field 3G, he would also be sampling much more. And in the end, you can see that there's a much wider area that is being sampled. One important thing to do with this type of sampling is to keep track where each core is coming from. So he, here he collected six cores, put all the cores into the same bucket, broke it up, mixed it really well, and put that into the bag and then he labeled the field 3B. So he knows that this bag is coming from field 3B. Here is field 3G and its respective bag, and then field 3K and its respective bag sample. So he knows exactly where each sample is coming from. Now let's look at the case where the farmer does not own the field and he's renting. So this is gonna be more of a field sampling uh, this will require bulk fertilizing application because you don't have that grid. You don't know on a two acre basis where uh, areas are high or low. So you're just gonna do an overall bulk application. This is minimum investment on sampling, but usually you lead, it leads the farmer to over apply fertilizer in the areas where they don't need as much fertilizer. Again, we have that same field, and what do we do now is we just collect sample on a zigzag pattern. And then all of those samples, for example, if you take 20 samples in one 20 acre field, you're going to put all of those cores into the bucket, that all gets mixed, and that gets labeled field three. So it's one sample only for this entire field, and before we were doing like 10 samples for that field on a two acre grid. Another example is when you have a much bigger bigger farm. For example, here there is about 100 acres. What you do is you break that up into four uh, sessions and then of about 20, 25 acres each session. And then you can decide how you wanna sample. You wanna do that zigzag pattern. You see that you can leave large areas where you don't do a sample, but you're being uh, thorough enough here that you are being somewhat representative. Whereas you could do something like this that is more random, but then this means that you're gonna be walking a little bit more to cover this entire area. Or if you have an ATV, then it can just be more strategic at how you are doing this. But in any case, you're just trying to minimize the areas where you don't have a sample so that you're trying to be as representative as you can in this entire field. Uh, now, a third case is what we call zone sampling. Uh, now, this zone sampling is also used with bulk fertilizer application. Uh, it has minimal investment on sampling, and it, it's a very good, a very good uh, approach for best management practice, and you'll see why. For example, this field, we can see that there's two different patterns in this field. Uh, there's this area here that have this brighter, images and there is area here that seems to be more homogeneous and this could just be a soil type that cut through here that had maybe 
uh, a less well drainage and you see this could be a wetter spot but this could also be an area in the field where there was some sand uh, potholes in there and then the sandy areas get drier faster and then that's what we're seeing regardless of being wet or drier or it could also be areas that are sensitive to some disease or areas that don't produce as much the idea is that we can separate these two areas of the field and then take samples differently so for example the top one we're going to call the field a or you can call field north or whatever you want to call it and then you go in there and you do your sampling again you can do it randomly or you can be more systematic and be like on a zigzag pattern but the main thing here is that you collect as many samples as you need for that area you mix it really well together and then you put that into a bag that corresponds to that field and then you got to remember as well what you label this field because then when the fertilizer the soil test comes back you need to be able to match that back to the field that you had and the same thing for the south part of the field you label the field b you collect as many soil samples as you see fit you mix it really well in a bucket and then you put that in a bag and then that's what gets sent for analysis now a fourth case for vegetable <laughs> garden uh, and this might be um, what most of you are dealing with so here we have a high tunnel to start with and what we start doing is defining where our beds are going to be in this example this is a tunnel that we use for research um, we've been using for the last 10 years this tunnel for research and we know we already know what each which bed is going to be doing so we can just go label bed number one bed number two bed number three could be that bed number one was going to be tomato bed number two peppers and bed number three onions or cauliflower or whatever we decided to do then you're going to go ahead and take some cores in here and again you're going to plant the entire bed to the same crop so we don't need to subdivide that bed you can just take maybe four or five cores in this bed this is a, a 35 feet long bed and i would say that five cores would be enough to be very representative of that bed and then again we put that into the bag that has the field that bed number on it so when we get the results we know where that test is coming from and we do the same for all the beds that we have in the tunnel the same works if you have your beds outside okay the same the same uh, theory applies here so you have your beds you decide what's going to be planted in each bed uh, if all the beds are going to be the same you might decide whether you want to do just one sampling i would strongly recommend you to test each bed individually unless they're very small if you're making beds that are 15 20 feet long 30 feet long maybe you can do every two beds gets a soil sample uh, so you could combine the course from this bed and the course from this bed and make it into one and then here the same this bed combined with this one and making into one sample so you have two different tests for this particular field uh, but if you are going to have longer beds then i would recommend or different crops i would recommend sampling each bed now how do we take uh, a soil sample uh, so depending what you're growing your crops for it's going to determine whether you're going to take a, a shallow soil sample or a deep soil sample okay for example if you're just looking at soil fertility then basic soil fertility at zero to six inches is what we want to do but now if you want to if you're growing like crops like corn, wheat, oats, and you want to know how much nitrogen is available in that total profile in that soil, then we do a deeper sampling, we do a zero to 24 inches uh, soil sampling to determine the amount of nitrogen available. Whereas for a base coat, soil pH, organic matter, P and K fertilizer, it's just a zero to six inches. And also micronutrients or whatever other nutrients you need, it's a zero to six. Only soil nitrate is the deep uh, sampling now if you are not uh, doing any uh, grains or, or vegetables or fruit 
if it's a grass, existing grass, then your sampling is gonna be a little different. You only wanna sample that top three inches. If it's a new grass though, you're establishing your grass in this year or next year, then you do a deep sampling because then you wanna make sure you see the total amount of nutrients that will be available for that seedling. If you have like flower gardens, uh, you can do also a zero to six. Now, if you're sampling for trees or shrubs, now those have deeper root systems. So you wanna do a little deeper. You wanna go down to a foot to be sure that you're capturing all the nutrients that that crop, that tree or that shrub is going to be seeing uh, in your field. How do we take a soil sample? Uh, there are a couple different ways. Uh, this picture here, we have a, a, a soil probe is what we use for research. It's very easy, very clean, very fast. Um, it's a long instrument that we put down on the surface and then we just, and we got handle, so we just push down the handle. Uh, and then we usually have a little indentation here that shows where six inches are. And then also have one farther above that shows the 12 inches as well. So we push it down until the indentation here marks the, the depth and then we put that back out and this is what the sample is gonna look like. And then we just use the finger to push it up from down here and then this entire core gets dumped into the bucket. Now that tool is a little expensive. If you don't have that tool, your little, uh, uh, little gardener scoop works as well. And the, what we like to see is we dig a hole uh, and after that hole is dug, we come on the side here, we take a, a cutting that is about a half inch thick. We insert our scoop right down there. And we like to insert that scoop all the way the length of this scoop because it's usually about six inches. So if you get the entire length of this scoop at a thickness of about a half inch, that will be a very good sample. So then you put that into your bucket or a bag or whatever you have. Uh, now, one of the most important things once you get all the cores for a bed or for a field is to thorough mix that sample. I can't emphasize enough how important it is for you to break the big clumps and make sure that you collect a very representative sample of that soil. And you will see why as we move on into the analysis of those soil samples. And here we are. So when you take your sample and you send it to the lab, you can select, we'll fill out a form, and then in that form, you are going to tell what you wanna test. Usually this top four things here is what comes on a traditional soil test. If you just send for basic soil test sampling, you're gonna get organic matter, you're gonna get phosphorus, potassium, and pH. And then if you want additional nitrate and ammonium, that's you have to ask additionally because the basic only covers organic matter, phosphorus, potassium, and pH. But that's not all that can be tested, right? Depending on what you're uh, growing, what the, the nutritional requirements of the crop is, and the sensitivity to metals and heavy metals and salts, you also want to ask for other things. So let's zoom in a little bit so we can kind of understand a little bit better what those soil sampling are doing. So if you remember, I said maybe 10 times that it's very important to mix it thoroughly that soil sample that you collect from each field or each bed. Because when you take those samples, you're probably gonna end up with a pound or two pounds of bag of soil in that bag. And when you send that to a lab, the amount that they're gonna use for analysis, it's very small. For example, for organic matter and soil pH, they're gonna use about a tablespoon uh, of soil in the analysis. Whereas for phosphorus and potassium, they're gonna be using a quarter of a teaspoon of that soil you sent. So if you do a very poor job taking your soil samples and homogenizing that sample, you're gonna end up with a very poor soil, uh, soil test coming back to you. Now, if you're very, very thorough, you mix that soil really well and you take a very representative sample, then your chances of getting the right soil sample is maximized and you're much better, um, better off knowing the fertility of your, your fields. Paulo, we had a question come in. Yes. It, it is, do you need two separate samples to do both nitrogen and nutrients? No, no, no. The, the same sample that you send in, the lab will do both analysis. 
what they do is, like I said, you're going to send about a pound of soil to them and they're going to use a tablespoon at the most for each analysis that they're going to do or a quarter of a teaspoon. So for example, if they're doing this analysis here, they're going to use a total of uh, two tablespoons for this, uh, for your base analysis. And then you want to do nitrate, they're going to use two, uh, a, a half of a teaspoon for the nitrate. Right? And then if you want to do boron or sulfate, and then you're going to use another tea tablespoon. So they're going to use maybe 5% of the soil you send in for the analysis. So you're already taking limited amount of samples and they're only going to use five to one to five percent of what you send in to determine your analysis. So be sure that it's very thorough, very well done because it will be very beneficial to you if you follow that procedure. If I didn't answer the question, please ask it again and, uh, and Ben will, will shout out to me. So here is what a soil test is gonna look like when you get it back. For example, this is one for one of the fields that we had at the station uh, and we sent it to the Minnesota Valley uh, testing. It's called MVTL, it's out in New Walm. But there are many other, um, other labs throughout the state and also in, other, in different states that you can test for. And like I told you, here's the, the initial analysis. We have soil pH. And here you see two soil pH. There's the soil pH and there's this buffer pH. This is only needed if you're going to be using a uh, lime application. If you have a very acidic soil and you need to apply lime, uh, then this would be what you use in the lime calculations. And then here's the organic matter content. Here is the Bray level for phosphorus and also the Olson P for phosphorus. Now, most tests in Minnesota will report both the Bray and the Olson. Now, the Bray test is used on when soil pH is less than 7.4. And that's because those soil with a pH higher than 7.4 would usually neutralize the solution and we would end up with just a water extraction. When the pH is higher than 7.4, labs are recommended to use the Olsen test, which is a bicarbonate extraction and is ideal for when the pH is high. But it's much easier for the soil testing labs to run both of them as opposed to running soil pH first and then decide what to do. The way they are set up, they just scoop the, the sample into the vials and they send it for analysis. And it's much easier for them to do this type of analysis. And then, for example, here we did, this is another uh, soil test feed. It's called the Malik. Our state does not use it, but Iowa I know uses, uh, some other states around us uses Malik too. So depending if you're on the border with the Dakotas or Iowa, you might end up with this test done but we do not use it. So if you're in this area, be sure to ask them to run Bray or Olsen. Do not use Malik because we don't have recommendations for Malik phosphorus. Here we did not ask for salts, so there's nothing reported. And here's our potassium levels. It's, uh, now the units here is another important thing. This is in parts per million, right? The Bray, the phosphorus is parts per million, parts per million, everything's in parts per million. If you want to know how much nutrient is available per, uh, per acre, you take this number and you multiply it by two. For example, this first one here has a, a Bray one of 7 ppm. How much P205 is available for, let's say, a crop of tomatoes? Then you multiply 7 by 2, you have 14 pounds of P205, which is very low. We'll be talking about those categories later. But, but that's what the soil test would look like. Now, why is the pH in the soil test important? Here we have a table with pHs going from strong acid to strong alkaline. Anywhere below five and a half is considered the strong acidic soil. Anything above eight and a half is considered strong alkaline soil. We like to see soils between six and seven, and that's where most agricultural soils tend to be kept at. But depending on the intensity of management, a lot of nitrogen fertilizer will tend to uh, draw your pH down and you end up with five and a half and below, and that's primarily due to nitrogen fertilizer. Now, why do we need to keep it between six and seven? 
you can see that as pH decreases, um, the majority of our macronutrients um, are, are decreased. You can see here that the bigger the bubble, the more available it is, and the lower the bubble, the less available it is. Whereas for micronutrients, we have most availability when the pH is more acidic because this is all metals and metals are more soluble in, in, uh, in an acidic condition, um, except for molybdenum. Molybdenum likes to be more available the higher the pH. And we can see that for the, macronut the macronutrients, a lot of them increase availability in, in the more alkaline phase because they are also, a lot of them are earth metals and they like to be more alkaline. Okay, now talking about the soil test category, primarily for uh, phosphorus and potassium, we have those categories uh, made available to us. So for phosphorus, it goes from very low to very high, and it's based on that soil test that gives you the parts per million of phosphorus extracted. And then here we have the Bray or the Olsen. If you can see here in this test, the same soil sample is going to have different numbers between the Olsen and the Bray. And that's because of how the extractant works. But what you need to know is that the levels, they are individual for each extractant. And this is going to help you determine how much fertilizer you need to be applying in any field that you're using based on the soil test value. Why did we come up with those soil test levels? Uh, because that guides us uh, to determine whether or not you're going to see a response to fertilizer application. For example, when you have a field that is testing low, that means that in more than 90% of that time, you're going to see a response in increased yield due to the application of fertilizer. When you have a soil that is testing medium, that means that between 60 to 90% of the times you're going to see a response. The soils that are medium to high, that's about less than half of the time you see a response to fertilizer application. Soils that are high, it's about 20% of the time you see a response. And soils that are very high, we usually don't really see a response to fertilizer application. And we don't recommend anything that is above high, high or above high, you will see that we don't recommend fertilizer application. Now to look at a at it a little differently. Here, this graph now shows your very low, low, medium, high, and very high soil test levels. And then here we have the amount of uh, fertilizer needed by the crop. And 100% means the maximum yield that that crop can have. For example, in a very low condition, about 10% of the fertilizer need is gonna come from the, the soil. And 90% is gonna come from fertilizer uh, or manure or external source of nutrients. When you have low, it's a little higher, maybe 35% of your nutrients come from the soil, 65 is coming from the fertilizer that is being applied. When it's medium, a little higher, maybe 60, 65% comes from the soil, 35% comes from the fertilizer, and high and very high, the soil has enough fertility in there that they can report, they can uh, supply all the fertilizer needs for the crop you are planting. Now, for example, uh, the way you you'd use this, uh, say you're planting corn and you wanna plant, uh, let's say, first you gotta define your yield goal. So you wanna grow over 200 bushels an acre and the soil sample came back in the low. We had a break P of say seven and your uh, awesome P was like six. So you're right here in the low and you're going to be broadcasting your phosphorus fertilizer. So you look here, it tells you that you need to apply 85 pounds of P205 per acre to make sure that that crop is gonna reach the potential of 200 plus bushels an acre. Now, if we're putting in a band, you can also put the fertilizer down on a band, then you would need about half of the fertilizer need. And this is because when you only put the fertilizer in a band, the fertilizer is much more effective at supplying that nutrient that that crop needs. Now, let's say if you're in the very high or the high categories, you can see here that the amount of fertilizer being recommended is the same, regardless of your yield potential. And in the very high, 
there is hardly any fertilizer being recommended because as I said before, that soil already has enough nutrients in there that it will supply their crops with all that it needs. And the case here in the hive that we are recommending is just insurance. We're just making sure that you're putting a little bit just so we are covering all the bases. But it's really, it's not needed because we know that once you are in this range here, um, in the high range, the soil is gonna supply all that the crop needs. Paulo, could you explain what a band is? So a band is, um, you. so a broadcast, you would get, let's say 100 pounds of PTO5 would spread over the entire uh, acre. Now, when you put it in a band, you take, instead of broadcasting of the entire end, you're making a line over a very small area of your soil and putting that fertilizer there. For example, the way this would work is if you have a planter, the planter is going in and cutting the soil and dropping a seed down. And then at the same time, there's another attachment to that planter that is digging the soil a little bit deeper and dropping the fertilizer right below that seed and to the side of that seed at the same time. So it's almost like you're planting the fertilizer in a very small area of soil. Is that clear? I think so. So it's an application uh, yes, related yes, thing, right? An application methodology to maximize the, the use of fertilizer. Thank you. Yes, yes, you're welcome. Uh, now, what you use for fertilizer application? Here at this table, I list some of the organic fertilizers, for example, manures, uh, green manures, um, blood meal, um, uh, rock dust or, or rock, uh, broken rocks, uh, ashes, and that all has different amount of fertility, depending on what you're planting and how you're basing your fertilizer needs, there are different materials that can be used to supply the fertilizers that you need. And there is also an organic fertilizer like your urea, uh, your hydrous ammonium, your uh, MAP, monoammonium phosphate, or the DAP, the diammonium phosphate. Those are all fertilizer sources that you can use depending on whether you're growing organically or conventional uh, fruits and vegetables or um, any other crop. And here are some examples, right, for uh, nitrogen application. So the nitrogen is based on the soil organic matter level. And like I told you, uh, they will run the organic matter and they're going to give you, they're usually going to rank between low, medium, and high. And they're also going to give you the total amount of organic matter in a soil. For example, uh, if you have a soil that has a low organic matter level and you're planting broccoli, this says that you're going to have to apply 180 pounds of nitrogen uh, per, uh, per acre to maximize the production of that uh, broccoli. Now, this came from a extension uh, publication that is called Nutrient Measurement for Commercial Fruit and Vegetable Crops in Minnesota. And this is great because it gives all this information and it also tell you the best way to apply um, this fertilizer. For example, here you can say you can put a third of the initial broadcast, you can put a third side dress two weeks after planting, and then the final third five weeks after planting. So it's telling you to apply this fertilizer needs three in three different times so that you maximize the efficiency of the fertilizer that you're using. Of course, if it's not possible to, if you gotta put everything up front right before you plant or transplant, then that's the way it works for you and that's the best you can do. Uh, and there's also tables for phosphorus, right? So just like for the corn and the soybean, there are tables for them for, so for the amount of phosphorus needed. We also have the same material for different fruits and vegetables. And again, this comes from the same uh, extension publication that I mentioned before. And if you uh, Google this uh, and you type in University of Minnesota Extension, Nutrient Management for Fruit and Vegetable Crops in Minnesota, you're going to come up with this uh, extension publication. You can download it, it's free, uh, and you can print it and, and have that available to you to help you determine uh, how much fertilizer you can apply. 
Now, um, I, I didn't ask you, for those of you that have gardens, what is the source of fertilizer they use? Maybe you can, you can drop that in there so I, I have a better idea of, uh, of how you've been farming. Uh, but manure, the use of manure has several awesome benefits. Uh, it increases soil carbon, and with a, a higher carbon content in the soil, you're going to be able to retain more available water. You're also going to help with infiltration, so excess water can leave the soil quickly, whereas the water that the plant needs, what we call the available water, is kept in the soil. It provides better aggregate stability, and this helps with the root penetration, root growth, and access of their root to a diverse uh, microbial community, which will also help ensure a diverse amount of nutrient cycling in that soil. Uh, it helps reduce soil erosion, uh, it reduces nitrate leaching, and it also helps provide all the macro and, and macronutrients that the crop needs all at once. And that's because manure has usually uh, everything that the, the animal is eating, whatever they don't need, it comes out in the excreta. And that's usually plant matter, and that has everything that plants need to grow. So you're supplying back everything that the plants need. And just in case your chemistry is a little back behind, what are the macro and what are the micronutrients? Macro is what the plant takes up in large quantities, for example, over three, four pounds an acre. Whereas micro is things that the plant takes up in small quantities, for example, ounces to the acre. Uh, and here are the list, so you can you can make some notes if you need to. Paulo, we had a couple um, answers come in from viewers on what they currently use for fertilizer. Yes, yes. Uh, let's see one, here. if you, I'll share these, if you have any comments on them. One said that um, they don't really use anything uh, except in the blueberries. With them, they mostly keep fighting the uh, acidic soil. Mm -hmm. And then another person said they uh, originally used chicken manure in their garden and now rabbit manure and also wood ashes. Okay. And a third uh, viewer said uh, dairy cow, horse, chicken, manure, pell lime, and wood ashes, but not all at the same time. Okay. Yeah, so those are all great sources of fertility. Uh, just a couple considerations is the ashes are usually very alkaline. So if you're putting ash down and you want to keep a soil under an acidic condition, for example, if you're growing the blueberries, for example, you do not want to do ash application because that's going to push your pH up. So it's going to counteract whatever measurements you're taking to keep that pH down. Uh, the one thing you want to be sure to look, which you might have some issues with on a blueberry, uh, it would be phosphorus availability because when the pH gets too low, phosphorus will bind to aluminum and iron in the soil and it might decrease availability. So it's good for you to keep checking on your phosphorus levels. Um, now there are a few things you can do you can i don't know what you are doing but you could use like a manure composting uh or a liquid composting where you add the water to manure and then you get that tea water or they call a, a, a yeah, they call it tea water and then you use that as your phosphorus source but you would want to also test and see how much phosphorus is in that tea water so that you're sure to apply enough uh, because you don't want to be limiting phosphorus to those blueberries, otherwise your yields are not going to be very good. If you're noticing that the blueberries are not growing, you're not getting a lot of production, it might not be the pH, it might be the fact that the phosphorus is not available. So just uh, do some checking if you need to get a hold of me. Uh, we can share my contact info. I had it on my first slide, but I can share it again. Um, or they can post. I can post it on a chat, and then you can get a hold of me. We had another person share that they use compost, grass clippings, and leaves for weed control, and then also dried fish powder and wood ash again. Yeah, yeah, those are very good, very good uh, sources. I wonder if you guys live out in the, in a farm and you have uh, some uh, wood burning uh, fireplaces and you use all that 
Ash from those woods. Another question was, is there something uh, better for soil acidity than bone meal? Um, so if you want to drop it quickly, there are some, the best, some of the things we see is uh, elemental sulfur, but that's a little bit slow acting. Um, and, and that's one of the best. If you can find a source that sells like a more of a very small granule or powder, I would say that that would be your best option um, that you would have available to, to uh, acidify your soil. Because uh, nitrogen fertilizer, we also cause acidification, but that takes a long time. I think with elemental sulfur, within one or two years, you can start seeing a pH drop. Whereas with nitrogen fertilizer, it takes a couple decades to see any significant drop. So a little more the benefits of manure. Uh, you want to be aware of uh, nitrogen availability. Not all manures have the same nitrogen availability, so we have a lot of guidelines for manure application on the extension website, so make sure you look at them. Also, the nitrogen to phosphorus ratio is not balanced. It's usually less than two to one. And most crops and vegetables, they require a, a two or three to one. So if you're putting all the manure to supply all the nitrogen you need, you are going to be over applying phosphorus and then you're gonna end up with a buildup of phosphorus in the soil. And depending if you have a high tunnel or not, if you have a high tunnel and put too much manure, you're also going to end up with a, a, um, too high of electrical conductivity, too much salt buildup in your soil and that can be very detrimental to the crops that you're growing. A couple of other options that you have uh, are green manures. Uh, for example, uh, cover crops can supply a significant amount of nitrogen to your crops. Um, and they add organic matter as just like manure, they have many benefits. They will improve water retention. Uh, they have a diverse root system that it's ideal for developing a very strong microbial community, which helps with nutrient cycling. Um, it can also uh, be a physical protection to wind and water erosion. And just as an example, legume cover crops can provide uh, very, very high amounts of nitrogen. For example, uh, clover fields we have found that can supply up to 40 pounds of nitrogen per acre, and alfalfa can supply as much as 70 pounds of nitrogen per acre. Um, now, there are some people that say the cover crops can also scavenge nutrients and bring nutrients from lower surfaces, from lower depths to the surface. Uh, this is not very well researched and it's not true in every case. It depends on the cover crop, depends on the soil type, depends on the crop that was planted before. So there's still a lot of question regarding the use of cover crop for Minnesota. But some of the main key things that we know now is that it does provide a lot of nitrogen if you plant legumes. And it does provide microbes with a lot of uh, diversity in food. So you provide, a, you end up generating a diverse microbiome for the crops that it's um, being planted. Um, it's usually best to keep your uh, cover crop thick. Uh, deal with, that will keep weeds from emerging and then you don't have to deal with cover crops and weeds. Um, the way you can terminate is you can uh, mow um, the cover crop and then you can till it under. So therefore, it's easier to, uh, to kill the cover crop. Uh, and you want to make sure that you don't let the cover crop go to seed because if it goes to seed, then you're going to end up with cover crop trying to grow when you're growing your main crop and it's going to be a very mess, very mess area for you there. Um, on a nutshell, there are some of the basic information that um, I have been sharing with uh, the home gardeners, the small growers, um, the local food growers just to provide them with some initial information on the importance of soil sampling. 
and how you can keep your soil productive on the long run and avoid developing problematic soils due to excessive buildup uh, of nutrients in the soil. And if we have more questions now, I think we have a few more minutes left. We can go ahead and answer them. We do. Thank you. And yes, that was a great, great and understandable overview for, for everyone. We appreciate it. Um, one question on uh, chicken and pig manure. A viewer composts it for three years before they use it on vegetables. Do they need to do that? Actually, no. So the way it works, if you are composting the manure and you're doing it by the guidelines, right? Because the guideline says you have it to turn frequently. It has to be moist and it has to reach a temperature of 150 degrees for a certain amount of time, for a couple of weeks at least. And that, what that does is that kills all the pathogens in that manure. If that happens, then you can apply your compost and you have no issues. Now, if that's not happening, if you just have the manure sitting in a pile and then you apply that to the field, then the guideline says that if you put the manure today and you plant tomorrow, if you have if you have to wait 90 days if you're harvesting the produce from above the ground before you can sell it or consume it to avoid the uh, pathogens and if the they are in contact with the ground for example potatoes beets carrots or any other other roots uh, radishes if they are under the ground then you have to wait 120 days before you can harvest them and commercialize them and that's mostly being safe and avoiding any uh, contamination with pathogens. Thank you. If anyone has any additional questions, feel free to put them in the chat and I'll relay those to Paulo. We had a, a follow-up question to that, that earlier question in the presentation about the two separate soil samples for both nitrogen and nutrients. Okay. Uh, the viewer was was confused because they saw the nitrogen sample should be 24 inches deep and another sample was six inches. Oh. So in that case, should you do two? Yes, yes, I'm sorry, yes. If you're testing for nitrate and you don't know the nitrate on your profile, then yes, you have to do the zero to 24. And then for that one, you only ask for nitrate. Don't ask for anything else. Because if you ask, if you take just one sample, zero to 24, and you ask for all the fertility, all your phosphorus, potassium, organic matter, it's all going to be underrepresented. So you're going to be, they're gonna tell you have less fertility than you actually have. So for nitrate, you do zero to 24. For everything else, you do zero to six. Thank you for clarifying. Uh, again, everyone, if you have any questions, feel free to throw them in the chat. We've got about five minutes left. Uh, there was a comment earlier, Paulo, on the uh, on taking soil samples. The the person says that they were in the Master Gardener core course, and uh, the session on soils. It was suggested that they uh, take samples in the shape of an M, which I guess would kind of be similar to your zigzag uh, approach, right? So they were told that that would cover thoroughly cover the entire sample area. Yes, that's true. Um, you can do you can do M, you can do a Z, you can do an X. The idea is to try to be representative. Um, and that's why an M might be better than a Z, depending on the field that you have. So the, just keep in mind that you want to be representative because when you send that to the lab, like I said, you're going to take about a pound of soil sample and they are only gonna use a tablespoon for the analysis. So the more representative you are of the field, the better results you're going to get. Thank you. If you want to follow and interact with us on the local foods college, the even though this is our last session for this winter, the discussion will definitely continue and we're, we're always exploring new sessions to have at, at later dates. So you can interact with us through our Facebook group, which is a really active uh, group to be part of. You can also connect with us on Twitter using the local Foods College hashtag and the Twitter accounts for RSDP and also Extension Small Farms team, which is at UMN Small Farms. 
If I can jump in, I'd like to thank everybody for participating and particularly thank Ben and Anna for inviting me for this presentation. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much. Thanks, Paulo, Paulo, and thanks, Anna. And thank you again for all the participants. And we will be in touch later on with future sessions. We appreciate it. Have a good night, everybody. Thank you.